Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Good Shepherd Church. It is so good to see each and every one of you here. And I trust that as you've come to worship, that you will sense and feel the presence of God. And also know that this is a safe place where you can bring all of your difficulties and problems. And know that as we worship together, all of us are sinners who are saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is good to see you in front of you is a pew uh, card or a registration card. Uh, if you uh, would be so kind, if you are here and a regular attender and member, I would encourage you to register your attendance uh, by signing that. If you are here and a first-time guest, we want to take this opportunity to welcome you. And just as you have connected with us, we would like to connect with you. So if you would be uh, so kind to give to us some information so that we can do that. If you are planning on attending the family night meal on Wednesday night, uh, please also indicate on that registration card the number from your family so that uh, our cooks can be adequately prepared for those of you who attend. I do have a couple of announcements uh, that I want to lift up to you. If you uh, help with hospital visitation, homebound and nursing care visitation and ministry, I want you to know that there is a brunch for you today at 11 o'clock uh, with our associate pastor, Phil, and uh, he is going to be uh, just saying thank you to each and every one of you who are involved with those ministries and also He's going to be sharing with you some information of where we are headed in the future. If you remember, just a, a couple of weeks ago, we had Z James Zanker, an unclouded day here, for a concert. I want you to know that three of those songs that we sang that day are included on the new CD. James is here out in the foyer narthex area, and uh, he's available after the service if you ordered a CD and would like to pick it up or if you would like to purchase one. I want to say a big thank you to Karina Weichel, our Director of Relationship Ministries, and all of her team for their labors and their time and their efforts going into our Friday night movie night. Uh, it was very successful, and it was great to have new first-time guests walk through these doors. I took the opportunity to meet two new families and sat down and had conversation with them and it was the first time that they had walked through the doors of Good Shepherd Church, so I was grateful for that opportunity. Also want you to know that today is the deadline for the contact information. If you have a child or a grandchild uh, for, that is going to college, our church wants to connect with them. Today is the last day to get that information into us. Today as we uh, gather for worship, We have a ravaging hurricane again south of us. We have the city of Houston still ravaged with destruction. We have fires to the southwest of us. And we gather today for worship with very, very heavy hearts. Because our brothers and sisters are facing natural disasters. And I would invite you to enter into this time of worship knowing that all of us need to continue to put our footing on the rock, and that rock being Jesus Christ. Today, as we gather for worship, I would invite you to take a few moments to pray for those who are less than fortunate than those who are going through great difficulty today, who have no place to worship who have no homes to return to. And may we ever be remindful of that as we give our praise and gratitude to God, even in the dark places of life. Let's pray together.
as we've settled our minds and focused on the presence of God in our midst, let us pray. <clears throat> Dear God, we are blessed to be here to worship this morning. Though we may come from different circumstances and arrive with various joys and concerns on our minds, unite us in our common love for you. Renew and strengthen our understanding of the teachings of Jesus, whom you sent to demonstrate your great love for us. Help us to move beyond our own thoughts, to take the time to truly connect with one another. Open our eyes to opportunities to care, not only for those in our immediate circle, but for those in our neighborhoods and the larger world in which we live. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's join together in lifting our song in praise to Christ. Would you stand, please? As a people who worship God together, let's spend a little time connecting with each other. Before you're seated, would you share greetings?
going to invite all of the kids, if you would come forward, we're going to share our children's focus. Good morning. How is everyone this morning? Good, yeah, yeah, I am too. It is a great morning to be at church, isn't it? I have a silly question. You ready? Silly? Have you ever gotten a present that you just had no idea what you were going to do with it? Happened to you? <laughs> that happened to me a few years ago, and my gift was on Valentine's Day, I do believe. That's your birthday. And it was from my husband. And here's what he gave me. He gave me this little light. Bright, huh? Well, I got to tell you, I was gracious when he gave me this goofy gift. Because I'm opening this goofy gift thinking, I don't need a light. It's Valentine's Day. I need chocolate and flowers. But I got a light. And so I, stay, I said thank you, and I tucked it in its little pouch. It even comes with this cool little pouch. And I tucked it in its little pouch, and I stuck it in my purse. And it sat in my purse for a really long time. And then one day, I was in this really dark spot, and I could not see what I was doing. And all of a sudden, I remembered, oh, I've got that light. So sure enough, dug around in the dark in my purse, found my handy-dandy light, and I was able to figure out what I was doing in that dark place. Huh. Huh. So then... How many of you went to the camp out here um, last summer, last spring, when it was raining and raining and raining? Caitlin, you were there with us. And I packed for the camping trip, and I didn't take a flashlight. And I'm laying in my bed at night, and I'm cold, and I have to go to the bathroom. We're in the woods, and it's dark, and the bathhouse is way over there somewhere, and it's in the dark, and there's no lights on, and I remembered I had my... My handy-dandy flashlight. This flashlight is really bright. It took me all the way to the bathhouse and back without tripping on anything, without stepping on anything squirmy, and it got me where I needed to go. So I have have a new appreciation for my gift that my husband gave me because obviously he knew something I didn't know, and I still carry it in my purse. But, you know, the other day I had a revelation. As I've learned more and more about Jesus and how Jesus works in my life, Jesus is kind of like this light. When I find myself in dark places, Jesus can help me out of them. When I find myself worried, Jesus can help me out of that. When I need somebody to walk along beside me, Jesus is always there. So Jesus is kind of like this light. He can show me the way. And you know what? We're going to learn more in Sunday school about how Jesus is our light. Can we pray about that? Dear God, you have come to us in the form of Jesus, 
And you have shown us the way so many times how to live our lives and how you would like for us to live. And we want to follow you. We ask, Lord, now that you be with us in this place. And as we leave here, that we too can be a light. We can show others how to love you. And all God's children say, amen. Good job, boys and girls. Let's go learn more about Sunday school. discovered at Good Shepherd over the past year is that this congregation has some incredible, phenomenal lay leadership, lay leaders who are a part of it. And Linda Fraley has been, or is, I should say, on our steering committee, also serves on staff parish, and she's going to come forward and share her witness of what it means to be a part of small group ministry. Good morning. Good morning. I'm a part of the lambs fold. Now that's a fold that takes care of the lambs on the back of the pews. We feed them and water them and bathe them when they need it. And this fold has been together for 20 years. Now I'm too young to be, you know, in it that long, but I understand <laughs> it's been together a long time. It does, it, it's there to fulfill a mission. It, does what Luke describes in Acts 2.42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. And that's what we do every time we gather on the second Tuesday and the fourth Tuesday of the month. We devote ourselves to study by looking through scriptural-based teachings. We spent time in Max Lucado's Traveling Light looking at the 23rd Psalm, line by line, if not word by word, to understand what it means to walk through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil, to know what it means to have a rod and staff for comfort. We studied that together. We moved on to Not a Fan by Kyle Eidelman to understand the difference between believing and following, to deny ourselves, to take up our cross daily and follow him. We spent 12 weeks in that. And then Francis Chan's Crazy Love. Not exactly the title of a book you would expect to be studying in Bible study, but it really is. And it's about the sacrificial love that Christ had for us and how we are to emulate that sacrificial love. It was a deep study and left some of us feeling somewhat guilty, but nevertheless worth the time. We also spend our time in prayer, bearing one another's burdens sharing in the joys and the victories that we have, and supporting each other. It doesn't happen overnight, but over time, the fellowship becomes family. The good news is it's without the bickering. So you get to share a lot of time together and grow close together. And I have to admit, we break a fair amount of bread, quite a bit. And in these two hours that we spend in each one of our gatherings, we grow closer together. We grow spiritually. It gives us the opportunity to learn as much as you can learn about Christ and the teachings of the Spirit and the teachings of the Gospel without going to seminary. So well worth the time. I encourage each one of you to consider the life groups that are starting up. There are small groups. Life stands for living in faith every day. Be a part of that. Let it become a part of you. I encourage you to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. I said in first service, I would like to join her life group just for the breaking of bread. I know how great she is at making desserts, and uh, I would like to experience that about twice a month. I was thinking about what I was going to say this week as we receive our morning tithes and offerings, and I thought about Jesus' Sermon on the Mount when he said, Let your light so shine that others may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. 
I want to take a moment to say thank you to each and every one of you for letting your light shine so brightly last week with your generous giving uh, toward helping uh, the hurricane victims in Texas uh, with the Hurricane Harvey situation. We uh, raised $2,272, which will be sent to United Methodist Committee on Relief. I am so happy and uh, elated that uh, Thursday night I had the opportunity to meet with our missions committee here in the life of this congregation, and they are already on board uh, with their compassion and their passion of how we're going to continue to help. And you're going to be hearing here in the near future, there's going to be a pallet uh, out in the foyer area with items that you can take the opportunity to donate uh, we're going to be making cleaning buckets and uh, first aid kits. And so some of you will be able to give in uh, larger ways. Others of you will be able to give in smaller ways. All of us will work together as we continue to reach out toward those who are going through such devastating times in their lives. Thank you. Thank you for letting your light shine. And today, if you want to continue to give toward the United Methodist Committee and Relief, the, the need is there. Uh, please just indicate so on an envelope or whatever uh, means that you choose to give, and we will make sure that it gets channeled uh, to the United Methodist Committee on Relief. And may I say that 100% of our gifts that are given for United Methodist Committee on Relief go toward the project. There are no administrative costs that come out of that uh, donation at all. That's one of the wonderful things about the United Methodist Church and our mission and ministry. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward at this time as we continue to worship through the giving of God's tithes and our offerings.
It's now time to talk about scripture and what we learn from it. Here, this introduction to our reading from Ephesians. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, told early Methodists, preaching alone, preaching alone cannot produce spiritual maturity. Therefore, Wesley required all Methodists to be a part of a small group of accountability, conversation, study, and action. Why did Wesley do this? Because Sunday morning is for listening, then the rest of the week is for living. He believed true discipleship and life transformation happens only in close relationships with others. Small group settings for Wesley provided opportunities to study God's word, discussion about spiritual battles, a time to pray for each other, and to create a context to live out the Christian faith in real life. Today, our scripture from Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus reminds us that we who are a part of a church are connected to Christ, the cornerstone, and also connected to each other. Would you please stand out of reverence for the scripture? <clears throat> Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Please remain standing for our next hymn. Church is one foundation, is Jesus Christ her Lord. She is as the creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With Brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, God's grace, mercy, and peace to you. Amen. 
I uh, would invite you to keep your Bibles open to Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, that is the text that I'm going to be using for the foundation of our message. Today we're launching a new sermon series that uh, Zach Schwartz, our director of youth and small group ministry, and I have entitled LIFE. And LIFE is an acronym for Living in Faith every day. Let's say that together. Living in faith every day. Over the next few weeks, we're going to take the opportunity to go to God's Word each week and discover how we can stay connected to God and also how we can stay connected to one another. And we're going to examine those components together. God desires that you and I uh, be connected not only to Him, but also to one another as we grow in our spiritual journey, as we develop into His disciples and, call and, and carry out His mission that He wants us to. A part of the vision of Good Shepherd Church is to provide to you those opportunities to do just that. Uh, it's going to be a part of our discipleship pathway as we live out our faith together. Small groups are an opportunity for us to continue to grow uh, and also to have a healthy congregation. You've heard us talk about small group ministry in our town hall meetings, but, and it's also a component of our new missions, or our new vision statement. The mission statement of the United Methodist Church is to make disciples for Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And just a couple of weeks ago, we adopted our new vision statement for Good Shepherd Church. Do you remember what it is? You don't remember what it is? I want you to know first service had it right down. Connect, grow, send. So let's say that together. Connect, grow, and send. Today I want to begin talking to you about the second component of that vision statement of connecting. One of the things that I really desire to do yet in life, and this is on my bucket list, I, I want to take the opportunity sometime to go to California and to see the redwood tree for us. Uh, Jean and Deb Midoff, and, and Deb is on staff here at the church, and she was there this summer, and so I invite you to take a moment to look at a couple of the pics that she shared with me from that vacation. I uh, discovered just a couple of weeks ago as I was doing a little bit of research on these trees that these are the largest living trees on earth. They are about uh, 300 feet high, some of them, and they're about 2,500 years old. But I discovered something when I was doing some studying about these trees I discovered that they do not have a very deep root system like other trees that go down into the earth hundreds of feet. However, I discovered that these redwood trees actually have a very shallow root system. In fact, only about four to six feet deep. And so I begin to ask myself the question, what is it that anchors these trees? <clears throat> what holds them together? What keeps these trees in place? And I learned that these tree roots are intertwined very tightly. They're tied with each other. They're interlocked with each other. And so when the storms come and when all the winds begin to blow, they, these redwoods continue to stand firmly. Why? 
Because they have this interlocking system, they support and they sustain each other. They need each other to survive. And Good Shepherd Church family, allow me to say this. I think that's a beautiful metaphor for the church of Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful metaphor for the life of this congregation. In fact, you and I are made for connection. Why? Because we're created in the very image of God, and our God is a relational God, and He desires for you and me to continue to stay in relationship with Him and to be in relationship with each other in the life of the church. You know, I've discovered as I've been a pastor for a number of years that we can come to church with 100 people, we can come to church with 200 or 500 people on any Sunday morning, and you know, sometimes we, we still feel all alone, don't we? Why is that? Because a lot of times I have discovered as I've been pastor that some people are not connected in any significant way. I discovered this week that one study found that over one half of Americans don't even know their neighbors' names that live around them or across the street. Let me ask you, do do you know your neighbors' names across the street? Do you know your neighbors that live beside you? Have you ever spoken to them? If you were to come up and ask me this morning, Pastor Tim, do you know all of your new neighbors? I sure do. I've been around to see every one of them. And I've got acquainted with them. Human beings are not made for isolation. We as human beings are made for connection. Connection to God and connections to other people. And what I want to do this morning as we approach this letter that Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus is to look at three metaphors that he begins to teach you and me about what it means to be spiritually connected. The first metaphor that I would like to share with you is this. I find this in Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. First of all, he teaches us to be spiritually connected is like being built into a building. If you have your Bibles, and and let me encourage you to continue to bring your Bibles to church. Some of you, you know, may need to kind of take it off the shelf and blow the dust off of it and uh, bring it to church with you. It's okay, you can laugh. First of all, he says, what? What? It's like being built into a building. Look at verse 22. Paul says in his letter to the church at Ephesus, what? He said, in him, or in Christ, you two are being built together to become a dwelling which God lives by His Spirit. Over a year ago when I was appointed to Good Shepherd Church as a lead pastor I soon discovered something. I soon discovered that this congregation didn't have a parsonage and that I needed to purchase my own home or or rent or whatever. And we soon discovered that as we began to look for a home in Fort Wayne, that this was absolutely a seller's market. Some of the homes that we began to look at were uh, sold within 12 hours. We didn't even have an opportunity to get an offer in on them. And then I discovered that some buyers were putting offers in way over the listing price in order to secure them. So long story short, Deb and I made the decision that we would buy a house that was being in the process of being built. And it was an interesting experience for me because I have never really paid much attention to a house being built or I've seen some buildings being built, but being a part of that process, I discovered something. 
I discovered that there were literally millions of hundred different, millions and different parts uh, that, that were welded together and hammered and, and nailed together and glued together. And, you know, they all had to be connected for it to be a sturdy and structurally sound. And, soon, and Deb and I soon discovered that as we were in the process of purchasing this place, we'd drive up to Fort Wayne ever so often, and we would take the opportunity to stop into seeing this house be built, and you know what we discovered? We discovered that there were some spare parts laying here and there and everywhere. And these parts didn't seem to be connected to anything else. And I even joked uh, with my wife a couple of times, uh, you know, is this place going to pass inspection? I mean, are they going to have it finished by the time that we need to move in? You know what else I discovered? I discovered also there were some contractor's tools that were left behind. And I said to Deb, I, I wonder if they'll ever come back and pick them up. Or, or they will, how, how can you lose tools? Good Shepherd Church family, that's a great metaphor for the church. You know, so many times I, I, I have seen people come to church and they may be connected to Jesus Christ, the cornerstone, and they're in relationship with Him but you know what? They're here on Sunday mornings and they're in and out, but they're never connected to anyone else. And they're kind of like spare parts laying out there. And through the years that I've been in ministry, I've seen so many Christians come to church and, you know, they start out maybe serving God a bit and they get involved just a little bit, but then, you know, the storms of life begin to blow over them, and they go through these crumbling circumstances in their lives, and all of a sudden, you, you discover something. You've discovered that they have gone out the back doors, and they're no longer serving God. They're no longer in relationship with God in a healthy way. And you know, I've discovered that so many people are like that because they're not connected to someone else. They don't have that support system. They don't have those roots that are connected and intertwined with someone else. Secondly, I see another metaphor. The second metaphor is this, to be spiritually connected is to be a part of a body. You'll find that in chapter 2, verse 14, even though we didn't read that portion of chapter 2. You know, one of the most common descriptors in the Word of God for the church is what? It's the body of Christ. And if you were to read the entire chapter, uh, chapter 2 of Ephesians, you would soon discover that Paul was conveying that the body of Christ is made up of both Jews and Gentiles. And what Paul is basically saying is this. Paul is saying that, that, that any differences should be totally erased forever because of the work of reconciliation that Jesus has done on the cross. That's what Paul is saying in verse 14 of chapter 2 when he scribed these words. He said, For Christ himself has brought to us peace. He united Jews and Gentiles into what? One people. When in his home body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. Now you may be seated there, and you may be saying, what does that mean for us this morning, here in this church, in this culture, and in this time? Every one of you are a part of the body of Christ. And God wants us working together in one faith, one God, one Savior, 
and one baptism. And so, therefore, God wants us connected. God wants us united together so that the work of Jesus Christ can continue. And what is the work of Jesus Christ? It's teaching and preaching the good news of His salvation. It's reaching out and ministering and healing and reaching out and serving others. And every one of us here have different gifts and talents. And while we may have different work to do for God, you know what? We belong to each other. We're connected to each other. And all of us need to be actively involved in the ministry of the church. We are designed for connection. One of the components of life groups that we're talking about and you're going to have the opportunity to hear more about it here in the future, we're envisioning these life groups where people are a part of these groups, not only getting together and praying and having a good time and and studying the Word, but going out into our community and serving. You know, being the hands of Jesus Christ, being the feet of Jesus, as we continue to reach out to those in our community who don't know the hope that Christ can and does offer to them. And then last of all, there's another metaphor. And the last metaphor that I see in this letter is this, to be spiritually connected is like being born into a family. If you have your Bibles, look at verse 19. What does Paul say? He said, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Now, there are two ways of getting into a family, isn't there? One way of getting into a family is you're born into a family right? You still with me? The other way that you get into a family is you're adopted into a family. Well, I want you to hold on to this for a moment because I want to share something with you. Roman law declared during this culture in this time that you could disown your child that was born to you for whatever reason. So let's say you have a baby, and uh, you have a female child, and you name her Sally, and Sally has uh, blonde hair, but you want her to be brunette, and you don't like that. Well, Roman law said, you know what, you don't have to keep Sally, even though she was born into your family. But Roman law said, if you adopted a child, you were forbidden ever to disown that child. Now, I want you to catch something here, Good Shepherd Church family, because this is so significant, theologically and biblically speaking, that it's life transforming. When Paul is saying that you are a member of God's family... When you are a member of God's family, he is letting the church know that they are not only born into the family through the washing of holy baptism, but God also adopted his family members. He brought them into the family. And because of this, you are in. You are a part of the family of God. And God's not going to disown you. God's not going to push you away. You're a member of his family. And as Paul said, we're what? We're sealed in Jesus Christ. And what does that mean? That means that we're not only connected to God, 
But you and I are designed to connect with other family members that we're a part of. You see, if you think this Christian journey thing is just you and me alone in the garden, you're missing a great point. Because I want to say something. God, throughout history, has always been at work with His people in community. You look all the way back starting in the Old Testament and you move all the way up through the New Testament, God is always at work with His people in community. That's another whole sermon series in itself. I want you to think about Jesus for just a moment. What did He do when He called His disciples? He he formed a small group. He created this group of connection. And when we look at the history of the early church, as Linda Fraley pointed out this morning, where do we find the church? We find them meeting in small groups in homes, living in open honesty and transparency with one another. I love what uh, Reverend Susan Kern Kester said at the opening of our scripture reading for the introduction. She said, Wesley, the father of Methodism, said, you know what? Preaching alone cannot produce spiritual maturity. One hour in this place on Sunday morning is not going to produce transformation and total discipleship in your life. Oh yeah, it's a beginning. I'm telling you, church, we as Methodists have to begin to reclaim our story. We we have a story that is phenomenal. We, We have an incredible story, and somehow spiritual amnesia has set in. Wesley said, Preaching alone, can't do it. And he made it a practice that anywhere he preached, that he wanted a small group to be started. He wanted a class meeting to begin to take place so that there could be connection, so that there could be accountability, so that they could have the opportunity to learn together. And why did he do this? Because Wesley knew that spiritual growth takes place where those early Methodists could support and sustain each other. He knew that we need each other in the church of Jesus Christ. One of the most incredible stories that I read was a few years ago. It was about Hero Nada. And I don't know if any of you know Hiro Nada's story, but he was the last Japanese soldier to surrender. In fact, he was a Japanese soldier that continued to fight even though the world was over, or even though the World War II was over, but he had never been told to surrender. And so he continued to live off the land and he continued to fight through the jungles and he carried on this very lonely battle all by himself. He was finally captured in March of 1974. 29 years. He was going about it all alone. And for 29 years, he said, nothing ever pleasant happened to me in the jungle. Brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus at Good Shepherd Church, You don't have to face the battles alone. You don't have to try to go through the jungles of life all by yourself. I challenge you today to begin to at least think about becoming a part of a life group where you have the opportunity to do life together. It's God's design for you, and it's God's design for me. Thanks be to God. Amen. This morning, 
as we respond to God's proclaimed word, and we take the opportunity to go to God in prayer, I want us to remember all of those persons around our country who are suffering at this time. You may be here and you may be saying, well, what is it that they can hang on to in these moments? And what is it that we can hang on to? And what encouragement do we have? And what foundation is there in the midst of all of this? Our sure foundation is that we can hang on to God's promises. Because God's promises for our lives are always true. And I would invite you to pray this morning for those who are going through great difficulty to continue to hang on to the promises of God in their lives and also know that everyone who is there helping recover, with recovery and helping with rescue, that they know, that they know that there are others that love them and there are others that are there in the midst of all their difficulty, that we as a nation are standing united, and that we as a church love even in the midst of difficulty. So let's pray. I invite you, the altar rails are open, uh, the candle lighting stations are available in the back. Let's take the opportunity to bring whatever needs that lie heavy upon our hearts and lives to the Lord knowing that he listens as we talk to him. Jesus is indeed our rock, our hope of salvation. I would invite you to stand for the closing hymn, an older gospel hymn that speaks that eternal truth. Shall we stand together and sing?
A few months ago, one of my newfound friends here in Fort Wayne uh, presented me a book from Australian Catholic author Matthew Kelly. And I was so profoundly impressed with his writing uh, skills and just how he writes that I wanted to have the opportunity to hear him speak. And I had made mention of that one Sunday morning when I was preaching. And so someone in this congregation gifted my wife and I and Kristen to have the opportunity to hear him speak. He was in Fort Wayne last night at St. Vincent de Paul Catholic Church, and I was there with about 1,500 other people. He's a motivational speaker, a Catholic evangelist. And one of the things that he kept driving home last night was this, be bold and be Catholic. (laughs) Can I say something this morning? Be bold and be Methodist. And what does that mean for us? Stay in love with God and always do good to others and do not do harm. Go in peace to serve the Lord. Amen.